Now, when people study the Yi Ching, the classic of change, what you encounter is a book full of 64 um, hexagrams, 64, 64 sacred symbols that have commentary on them. And what they do is largely used for divination, is the idea. Now, divination already sounds a bit out there, sounds a little bit crazy, and, and fair enough. I'm not here to convince anyone of any belief system. But I think that sometimes maybe people have looked at the idea of divination wrong, because divination suggests telling the, the future, telling people's fortunes. But that's not what actually what the I Ching is about for me. The I Ching is more about insight to the current nature of change in any given moment. So to understand the I Ching a little bit, um, if we look at that, we can understand that to, to the Taoists or to the people who developed the I Ching, maybe they didn't call themselves Taoists at this stage, but this is what they evolved into. Their view was that nothing actually happened randomly. Um, everything happened according to the rule of causation. So even though something might appear random, um, actually it's just a causation chain that's too complex for you to see. Luck is a causation chain that's too complex for you to see. Uh, chaos is a causation chain that's too complex for you to see. And often it appears chaotic or appears lucky or it appears random because actually you don't have any insight to how you have set up the causes that lead to that moment. That's essentially what we're talking about. So if you want to understand on a really simple level, Say you went around your day completely unaware of what you said and what you did and what you thought and how you acted and you walked into lampposts and you bumped into people and you offended them accidentally without any idea you were doing it just because you're a blunt idiot who doesn't know what they're saying. Sounds a bit like me, actually. If you were completely unaware of all of those things, what would happen is you would set up a series of causations around you. People would get annoyed. People would see you as clumsy, get out of the way, make you nervous. Like All of these causations would be taking place and you wouldn't be aware. And then what would happen is, is people react to you in a certain way and their reactions, the things that happen around you would all of a sudden appear random. Why is that happening? Why are people talking about it? And it's because you're unaware of your, your things that you're putting out. Now, that's an obvious example, right? It sounds a bit basic. But then the more aware you become of your actions, the less this sort of random, unlucky or lucky chaos you cause around you. So you develop more insight. And you'll see this in traditions that place an importance upon mindfulness. Um, this is what they're trying to, one of what they're trying to do is become more aware of what they're doing, more aware of the causations you're establishing for yourself so that more luck and fate and, and randomness and chaos starts to disappear for you and things start to appear more ordered because you understand how you are the center of, of the causations around you. doesn't mean that you're not affected by causation that's come from elsewhere, but a large percentage of your causation is taken care of because you're suddenly more aware, you're more mindful. Now, the I Ching is a way of enabling uh, you to develop that awareness of the causation within a present moment using a ritualized practice. So the early, earliest ways divinators would do this in ancient China, I believe, would, would be to throw bones into a fire, chicken bones or, I don't know, something, dinosaur bones, probably not dinosaur bones, but you know what I mean, they throw something in a fire, and they would look at the way it split, the cracks, because obviously they, they crack when they get hot and it looks random, but it's not random, it's a causation that's taking place, um, that, that they would then read. Now, this is where it gets a little bit esoteric, a bit woo-woo for many people, is the idea is that at any given moment, within a, a section of time, there is an interaction taking place between heaven and earth, between yin and yang. Um, and everything is to do with the way yin and yin and yang interact with each other. And we are sat between those two places. Now, the yin and yang of us is between essentially our, our higher consciousness and our lower purpose or our, our body and our mind. Um, it's between ourselves and the world around us. It's also between our body and the way it interacts with the uh, the cosmos in the case of astrology or the way that our body interacts with the world in the case of feng shui um, or our mind interacts with the world in case of feng shui so we have all these interactions taking place and all of these become a form of chi a form of energy and i don't mean like a magical liquid energy that can be shot out of your fingertips or something i mean just um, a transformation that's taking place according to these causations that, that surround us now according to I Ching theory there were 64 main ways that this yin and yang could interact with each other, which sounds very odd, I know. It's very mathematically organized. And it's this kind of thing that always makes me laugh when people say spirituality is very vague, there's no definition, uh, Chinese arts are very non-specific. Well, actually, I mean, if you're going to say the Chinese arts are very non-specific, you've got to then try and figure out, well, how come the Chinese then had 64 very, very specific ways that yin and yang could interact at any one given moment to generate the qi, the energy of an, outfold, of an unfolding outcome? I would say that a, a nation, a culture that listed things that, that 
sort of <laughs> exactly in 64 ways probably weren't into the woolly or the vague. They were very, very specific about, about what they were doing. So, when we're talking about that, yes. Because the idea was if somebody could put themselves into a ritualistic mindset, okay, which is essentially to absorb yourself into a process to such an extent um, that the outside world would fade away, the mind would fade away, just kind of like repeating a mantra or counting something or repeating a word or focusing on something till everything else fades away. A ritual is another way of doing this. It's like a way you can use samadhi, mental absorption and concentration to access the correct state uh, so that you are absorbed into the randomness, the chaos that's taking place at that moment. This is why they use Yara stalks. If you've ever used Yara stalks within I Ching, what they do is they cast the stalks and they have a, a very complicated, um, it's, it's kind of, com it is complicated when you don't know it. Once you get used to it, it's easy. Casting the Yara stalks to create a, a six line hexagram. Now people think it's a kind of, don't use the coins by the way. The coins don't have the same kind of ritualistic energy to them. If you, if you use the coins for the I Ching, I would suggest throwing them away um, and, and learn the Yara stalks. And sometimes people say, well, they're both as good as each other. Actually the ritualistic aspect of the, of the Yara stalks is much better. It's a lot more involved and you're more likely to enter the right mind state with the Yara stalks. Don't use the online hexagram generators. There's an app I think people have on their phone where they go hit scram of the day. Don't do that. You need the ritual. Because the idea is when everything else fades away, you're absorbed into that moment and then you can access the randomness that takes place. So the result of the way that the I Ching um, creates a reading, the result of the way that the Aristotle show you, show you a hexagram is they show you how yin and yang is interacting at that particular moment. So that doesn't, that's not divination. That's not future telling. That's not, that's not actually saying you're going to meet a tall, dark, handsome stranger and have four kids and a Lamborghini. It's not that kind of thing. Um, it's more that it shows you how in and Yang are acting, interacting at that moment, which shows you the causations that are taking place right now. Now, that causation can be to do with what you're doing or it can be to do with other people or whatever, but it gives you an insight to causations. And then what happens is you practice long enough with I Ching and you become au fait, you become comfortable with the way yin and yang can interact, you have a conceptual model to understand it, and it develops a higher degree of causation understanding. Um, and this is largely what the I Ching does. So if you wanted to break down in a very simplest term, what does the I Ching do? It's to build wisdom. That's it. It's to build wisdom. It's to help you become wise. It's not to help you become intelligent, because intelligence is largely, to me, the memorization of information, to be clever, to recall things. Wisdom is not the same. Wisdom can be with intelligence, it can be separate from intelligence, and wisdom to me is to understand the unfolding of something, to see the bigger picture of, of the cause and effect of how something has taken place, based upon your experience, yes, but also based upon an insight into the way that causation happens. Well, this is how wisdom is, is viewed within the Eastern arts, in my opinion, this is how they, they discuss it. So the I Ching is a wisdom builder. So you have this little little method to do it with the, with the, with the Yara stalks, um, and if you practice it for a long time, it's amazing that even if you don't like focus why, like I've seen people try to mathematically work out the secret of the I Ching. There's so many books on that. Well, yeah, you get this reading because two to the power of six combined with 64 times 128 will mean statistically this is more likely. No, forget all that. As soon as you start to analyze the tool, it, it breaks down. It's kind of like if you become a filmmaker I know some, some of my friends who are filmmakers. You can't watch a film with them. You sit down and you watch a movie and you're like, well, look at that special effect. And they're like, well, yeah, but the lighting's done like this and the green screen and maybe the timing was, you know, and, the, and they've analyzed it to the point where there's no joy involved in it anymore. They've dissected the movie to the point that the movie is no longer watchable. And people would do that with the I Ching. Once you dissect the tool mathematically of the I Ching, as fascinating as it might be, B for a, a nerd. But the more you break it down, the more you analyze it, the I Ching no longer exists. It's like the tool is broken. It's not developing wisdom anymore. Now it's building intelligence. That's the wrong thing, okay? We don't want it to build intelligence. We have other things for intelligence. We have Sudoku, or however you say it. We can use that for intelligence, maybe, or reading a book. But, the, but we don't have many tools for wisdom, um, and the I Ching is one of those. So I think if we have a tool for wisdom, developing an insight into causation chains, we should keep it as that and, and venerate it for the amazing tool that it possibly is.